All right, let's talk about skin injuries. Um, there are two types of skin injuries that can occur. Closed wounds and open wounds. Closed wounds are just one type I want you to be familiar with. Known as a contusion, you might know them better as a bruise. And this is basically a wound that doesn't open up, so there's no external bleeding. All the bleeding happens inside, and you end up with that sort of um, brownish color, blackish, greenish, bluish color on your shoulder or on your under your skin as the the wound goes through the healing process. We also have open wounds. And I want you to know about four different types of open wounds. And if you look on this figure, you'd say, oh, there's five different types. But what I'm doing here to get four is I'm including lacerations and incisions in the same, in the same class. All right, so uh, abrasions. These occur when skin is rubbed or scraped away. Okay, so you might skin your knee, you fall off the bike and skin your knee, or skin the palms of your hand. And that would be an example of, a, of an abrasion. We have lacerations. And I'm going to include incisions in there as well. And this is just simply a cut in the skin. And really the difference between a laceration and an incision, a laceration is typically really, really nasty and jagged, whereas an incision is typically surgically and precise. So this is just simply a cut through the skin. My favorite is an avulsion. And an avulsion is a tissue, or is when the tissue is partly or completely pulled away or removed from the body. Is that your favorite? Uh, Why saying, do you have a big? Why not? I mean, that's <laughs> brutal. So, like. So. <clears throat> Maybe you're working with your table saw down in the basement, <laughs> and things get a little hairy, and the blade doesn't only cut wood, it also pops that finger off. That would be an avulsion. And the last is the puncture wound. This is when something's pierced with a pointed object. <clears throat> and so you can think of a knife fight here or something along those lines. I mean, they give the example of stepping out of pin, but I mean, how, how weak is that? I would, I would put like a dude stabbed to, to, to illustrate the puncture wound. I and mean, I think that would be hardcore. <laughs> okay. Now, there is one other type of wound. It's the worst type of wound. And that worst wound is known as an owie or a boo boo. An owie or a boo boo. Is that serious? No. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I mean, are you kidding me? <laughs> I just put worst wound. The worst type of wound is an owie or a boo boo, and it sometimes needs a little bit of a kiss. <laughs> I can say that kind of stuff because I have little kids at home. <laughs> Actually, my son did get an owie tonight. We were trying to keep him out of one of the cupboards. And we were pulling him out, and he got away. And my wife wants to shut the cupboard. Oh, and he got his head back in there. A <laughs> <laughs> uh, poor kid cried, but he grew up a little bit today. <laughs> Life experiences, if they don't kill you, it's a good day. <laughs> <laughs>
What does that say in the parentheses? It says pelvis. <laughs> what? It says whatever you want it to say. <laughs> All right, so moving forward, gosh, we are getting so far behind. It's <laughs> awesome stories. All right, so let's talk about the second part of the integumentary system. We've already gone through skin and coloration and wounds and things like that. So let's talk about the hair. Um, just like skin's known as integument, the hair that are known as pillus. And it has some pretty crazy anatomy. And I'm going to talk about this in, uh, we're going to look at two different, uh, hit basically, histological sections here. We'll look at the cross section, and then we'll take a longitudinal section through a follicle. So let's start out with the cross section. So that's what this first image should be. Uh, so the cross section, believe it or not, crazy as it is, your hair is actually made up of cells which maybe you didn't realize that. Um, and the hair itself, individual cells, they form into two, two layers, an outer layer making up the hair cuticle, and then an inner layer that it consists of both the cortex and the medulla. The cortex and medulla are more or less living cells, if you will, and then the outer layer, this hair cuticle, <clears throat> are dead cells that are um, basically a protective covering over the hair. Then we can look at the cell, or I'm sorry, the hair um, as a follicle, and this is more of a longitudinal section through the length of the hair. So what you were just looking at would be if I were to take a section right through here, we're observing that cut uh, through that section. This is now the hair, and then in context of the tissue itself, the surrounding tissue. And so you're going to see things like blood supply, and you're going to see the matrix that uh, has all of these cells that are slowly growing up in this direction to lengthen the hair. You can see the cortex and the medulla and the cuticle once again here. Uh, just two different uh, locations of the cell, the upper root shaft, uh, sheath and then the, the lower root sheath. Uh, and really, the thing that's probably the neatest uh, about this is this tiny little muscle here called erector pili muscle. And we still have these in humans, and it's what causes goosebumps. Or I guess a lot of times people call them goose pimples down here. Yeah, goose, goosebumps. And you know, goose pimple sounds really kind of gross. Like, oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> so, erector pili muscle or pili erector muscle, and it will contract and it will cause this tissue to stand more erect, and you get that little bump in the, uh, in the follicle. There's also sebaceous glands and other glands that help to maintain things like nutrient uh, oils around the, around the hair shaft itself. All right. Do you know that hair has a cycle? And it's known as the hair cycle. And this is the description of a hair developing, growing, and then falling out to be replaced by another hair, if you're lucky. Sometimes the hair falls out and never gets replaced. <laughs> Which seems to me, I'm, in my personal opinion, that's like the true male faculty like haircut is to just be bald. <laughs> From the president on down to Dr. Reynolds to other members of the faculty. And of course, Dr. Reynolds and Dr. Kaner try to compensate with facial hair. And if you've ever heard Dr. Uh, uh, Kaner make fun of people, he talks about how real men have beards. I can grow a beard. In fact, I had a beard up until this morning, but I can also grow it on my head. So, <laughs> I'm going to show him this video. <laughs> I don't know. I don't think those two look very bad. They, they don't look bad with, without hair. So, I mean, they're, it's not like really like, oh my gosh. 
But me, I think if I was bald. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is there like a van around here with no windows? Who is this profile? <laughs> <laughs> But I'm not bald, so I'm not bad. You have a white chunk there, can you style it? What? <laughs> All right. So there are three stages in the hair cycle. The first stage is antigen, and antigen lasts between six and eight years. And during this time period, we have this structure that begins to develop that's known as the hair bulb. And the hair bulb begins to descend towards the hair matrix, which begins to produce cells that are going to begin to accumulate keratin, or what we would say is keratinized. Okay, so for about six to eight years, you basically have the bulb descending and the hair matrix forming these keratins, and the hair begins to elongate, and it's got that cortex, uh, I'm sorry, the cuticle that protects it. Those are the cells that keratinize, and it continues to grow. And if you don't cut it, you get long hair. If you cut it, it still continues to go through antigen and just continues to grow. Eventually, we're going to get to the next stage of the three, which is catagen. lasts about two to three weeks. And during this time, we have stoppage of growth. The bulb uh, <clears throat> itself begins to keratinize. So up here it was non-keratinized. It was dynamic and growing. Now it's beginning to keratinize. And so it's becoming more and more like the cuticle. And then the lower portion of the follicle degenerates. And as that happens, the degeneration leads to formation of a free club hair. Not to be confused with the hair club for men. So this club, this this hair club that's free now is actually going to be, um, and you can see that here in this picture here, it no longer has... Uh, any attachment. And then we move into a one to three month stage called telogen. And the dermal papillae moves towards the surface. This leads towards the hair falling out. Now this whole process, each individual hair on your head is somewhere within this cycle. Some of them are in the middle of that six to eight year antigen phase. Some of them are actively undergoing telogen. If you kind of rub your hand through your hair and grab on a little bit of a hole there, you might have some hair that comes out. And that was hair that was ready to fall out during that telogen phase. Fortunately, the hairs are in different stages of the cycle, and it's not like you wake up one day and you cut your hair and all your hair is <laughs> Oh, dang it, I'm in telogen. I'm going to be bald. I'm going to be bald for the next couple of weeks. <laughs> Guess i got to go get in the van now. <laughs> All right, let's talk about hair color. 
What do you think produces a variety of hairs, uh, of different hair color? What? Pigments. Okay, is there a, a specific pigment that you might want to? Yeah, there you go. Melanin. And we have both you and theomenal melanin, and the concentrations of melanin are going to occur in the cells that make up the cortex. Not the cuticle and not the medulla, but the cortex. So this is just sort of a schematic, if you will, of um, the, the hair color. We were going to, here's our cortex, and you would see that's where we concentrate our melanin, the, both eumelanin and theomelanin, uh, to give different uh, tones and, and depths of, of hair color. So obviously, darker hair color is going to be higher amounts of that eumelanin, which is very black. Lighter hair color is going to be more along the lines of higher field melanin concentrations. And then some of us who are turning gray have very, very low concentrations of both. Why are you laughing? It's not funny. You don't look like you're turning gray. What's that? I don't look like I'm turning gray. I go to the I go to my uh, stylist. <laughs> <laughs> I go to my hairdresser. She's not a barber. I wish I could. I go to my barber. <laughs> we talk about uh, football. Um, I go to my stylist, and she cuts my hair, and I look down at her, and, and she has a black, I don't know what they're called, schmock, I guess. <laughs> Whatever they drape over you to keep the hair off of you. And I look down, and it's just like all gray hair. Hair's cutting off. I don't know. <laughs> I don't think so. It's very sad, because I'm only 35, and I'm like, that's not that old. But if it turns any more gray, I'm just going to pack it in. Here's all the final two years of my life. Fucking driving around. <laughs> All right, let's talk about cutaneous glands. Sweat glands are one of the most common cutaneous glands that uh, show up in the integumentary system. <clears throat> this is a great picture because it actually shows the sweat that's being produced. Sweet. Um, sweat glands come <clears throat> in a couple different types, and really it's based off of how the material is actually going to be produced and delivered that differentiates the different types of sweat glands. Um, I'm going to want you to know about two different types of sweat glands. The first is the apocrine sweat gland. This has a pretty limited distribution. And it produces an aromatic sweat. Yes, it has an aroma, and it's directly into the hair follicle. Okay, so you can see an apocrine, ap apocrine sweat gland here distributing the solution sweat into the hair follicle, and then that permeates up that follicle. Then we, well, before I go on, um, the way that the material is secreted the cells that produce this aromatic sweat release the material by membrane blebbing, which is such a great word. So membrane blebbing. And really what that is is the sweat. So here's my cell. The sweat's produced, and it gets caught up into the membrane. And the membrane just kind of for, forms these little packets and blebs out. So the sweat's inside of here and it just blebs out. It just, and then that sweat is released into the lumen, the open space of the apocrine sweat gland, and makes its way 
up here into the um, into the hair follicle. Uh, now, where are these found? A lot of these are going to be found in places like the axillary region, which is the armpit. And you've all, if you've ever been in a gym locker, I don't know what the women's locker room smells like, but the dude's locker room stinks. And that foul odor, it comes from this sweat. But it's actually not the sweat itself. It's actually from bacteria that are present that induce the release of fatty acids in the material. And it's actually that release of fatty acids that gives off that distinct that induce what? odor that induce the release of fatty acids. Does anyone happen to know the physiological term for do your pits stink? Rome hydrosis. So next time you're in the locker room, it's terrible Rome hydrosis. That's physiology. Physiology burn right there. The mammary glands that we find in female female reproductive system are actually modified apocrine sweat glands. One of the modifications that occurs here is the sweat that's produced is thickened, and so the secretion is a little bit thicker. We call that thickened sweat. We call that milk. So yes, every time you have a glass of milk, even if it's dairy milk, you're drinking cow sweat. Um, Booyah. <laughs> I don't drink milk. <laughs> I like to get mine processed a little bit more, have it in ice cream. <laughs> so these develop in females during pregnancy. They're always present, but they're in a non-developed state, and then they develop um, more fully. Um, and in reality, they're, they're really diffuse, and we can say normally not really present or present in very, very small traces. And then they more fully develop with the uh, hormone endocrine changes that occur during uh, during and following pregnancy. Okay, so um, release of uh, milk during lactation, the membrane blebs and releases milk into the duct where it's delivered to uh, the suckling baby. Or if you drink milk, it's delivered to you through a cup. That's gross. You can really admit that that's pretty gross. I'm going to go have some cow sweat on my cereal tomorrow morning. My lucky charms. The other type of sweat gland is the merocrine or eccrine sweat gland. These are much more widely distributed. The secretion is released from these glands, from the gland cells through exocytosis. So these get packaged up into vesicles, and those vesicles containing the sweat dock up here at the membrane, form a little pore, and then the material sweat. Out of the, the eccrine or merocrine sweat gland is going to secrete through a ductwork directly to the skin surface. 
So the things that you would call sweat pores or skin pores are actually the openings of these eccrine sweat glands distributing their sweat into uh, onto the skin surface. And this wide distribution, we're going to find these on all different parts of the integument. They are used to induce evaporative cooling to help out with body temperature regulation. Now, there are some of uh, these cells that actually have small little contractile cells known as myoepithelial cells. Myoepithelial cells. And myoepithelial cells, uh, it's myoepithelial, so it's a muscle epithelial cell. So you find it in the epithelium, but it has a higher level of contractile ability. So these are contraction cells, contracting cells. that are responsible to push secretions out of out of the gland. And so you can see them represented in both of these figures. Uh, you'll have the um, myoepithelial cells surrounding those, uh, the, the ductwork and it squeezes on that ductwork to push the sweat up and out. All right, so let's talk uh, just a little bit here briefly about what sweat actually is. Okay, so sweat, it is going to be slightly acidic. And as it gets deposited onto the surface of the skin, it creates a slightly acidic environment on the surface of the skin that is referred to as the acid mantle. And this acid mantle becomes a protective mechanism, protects us against microorganisms and, and other pathogens. And it becomes just an in, inhospitable environment. So, you know, you're breathing uh, microbes in right now. There are microbes in all around you, the tabletops. And the acid mantle is keeping the, the likelihood of those microorganisms from invading your body uh, at bay because of this acid mantle. Sweat also is going to contain a large amount of waste products. In fact, so much so that the skin sometimes is referred to as the third kidney. Uh, kidneys are... Um, important in waste removal. The skin also <coughs> has a large part in waste removal and, and is uh, occasionally considered to act as a third kidney. The sweat is also going to be important in, uh, in, in the production evaporation equilibrium. Um, we have insensible perspiration that occurs every day. About 500 milliliters, half a liter per day of sweats produced that you don't even know about. So it's insensible that helps out with the evaporative cooling process. Now, you're all aware that sometimes you have higher levels of production. When that occurs, that's referred to as diaphoresis. This is just simply heavy production. Most frequently associated with uh, exercise workload, but could also be associated with just hot Georgia temperature temperatures or even some pathophysiology, things like... Um, fever and things like that can generate some heavy production of sweat. Um, normally, the, the imperceptible, again, 500 milliliters per day. On average, diaphoresis can yield up to one liter per hour 
of sweat production. And then again, just so that we're all very, very clear on this, so you reconsider your conception habits. Milk is a modified specialized version of sweat. And now that all of you know that, I fully expect that at lunch tomorrow, if you have a glass of milk, that you will not refer to it as milk, but simply as specialized calcium. Okay, sweat glands aren't the only glands that are present in the integumentary system. We also have sebaceous glands. And sebaceous glands, got a picture of those as well. These are going to be glands that open up into a hair follicle. And they produce not sweat, but an oily substance known as sebum. And what this oily substance does, as it gets deposited, dire deposited directly into the follicle, is it is going to act to protect the hair from drying out. Uh, the sebaceous gland is considered a holocrine gland. And again, the term apocrine, eccrine, or merocrine, and holocrine are all based off of how they produce and distribute their solution or their substance or material, whatever you want to call it. So the case of producing sebum is through a holocrine, holocrine gland process. And I've shown you a holocrine gland here. And basically, we have the release of the whole cell, and then that cell degrades, breaks apart, and releases the sebum after the disintegrating cell is broken, broken apart. And then that cell that's been released and degrades away is just simply replaced by neighboring cells via mitotic division. <coughs> All right, a little fun fact here. Sebum, uh, when you wash your hands, you're removing sebum, and there's a lot of products that, uh, and, and, and you all um, probably have experienced dry skin before as you're removing that material away. You eliminate that oily substance, and your skin begins to dry out a little bit uh, because that's the purpose of sebum. And there's a whole host of different products you can go to. No, not the bath and body. Have bath and body works, and you can get your nice pomegranate scented oil. And <laughs> not that I do that. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, does anyone know what that, what those lotions are? It's actually sebum that you're just putting back on, but it's not for human origins. It's actually most commonly you know. So you clean away the natural, naturally produced sebum, uh, and then lather yourself up with cheap oil. Do a lot of lotions cost like thirty dollars? Um, no, not really. You're you're basically just kind of adding that material in up here and. Then next time you wash your hands, you're washing your way and then you reapply. Um, the best way to keep your hands and everything hydrated is to stay well hydrated with water. Uh, sometimes, yeah, you got to use, I mean, it, it can get really, really dry and you just can't keep up with water consumption. And so it's nice to have a, a moisturizing cream, but most of that stuff contains product that's being produced from other sources, and a lot of those are going to be animal sources. A closely related gland to the sebum, uh, the sebaceous glands, is going to be the ceruminous glands. 
Uh, in fact, these are basically sebaceous glands, but we find them in the ear canal. And this is uh, a gland that generates, it still generates sebum, but that sebum mixes with epidermal cells that are sloughing off from the ear canal. And so it combines, the sebum combines with those epidermal cells. <laughs> And we generate a material called cerumen, which you'll know better as earwax. And this is being produced. Uh, it's important in maintaining the health of the eardrum and protecting the uh, ear canal. So it protects the ear canal and the ear drum. What is it saying? Cerumen. Earwax. Oh, man. All right, you're going to have to stay over for just a few minutes. Mostly because I told you some fantastic stories tonight. So give me about five more minutes, because I want to just finish up. What? Yeah, that's a number 11. I'm going to finish up the integumentary system. We're going to talk about calcitriol, uh, calcitriol pathway or calcitriol physiology. This is a really neat pathway that leads towards some really interesting stuff. And one of the reasons that I'm bringing this up here, I actually could bring it up with a variety of different uh, organ systems, in fact, we'll come back and we'll revisit this in the, when we talk about the skeletal system. But this just really shows you how all of these different types of tissues and organs really interact together to maintain homeostasis. So this, what you're looking at, is the calcitriol pathway, and it leads to the production of this hormone here, calcitriol, that goes on to have these effects of causing bones to have... Um, or to alter bone deposition, to reduce the excretion of calcium and phosphate from the kidney, and to increase the absorption of calcium and phosphate from your diet. So this calcitriol pathway is really going to be a calcium and phosphate handling system. And it is going to result in an increase in the amount of calcium circulating in the bloodstream. So when we need higher levels of calcium in the blood, Part of this is going to be achieved through the calcitriol pathway. And it all begins in the skin. And in particular, we're going to begin in the keratino sites. So these cells located, again, in the epidermis of the integument are going to be exposed to UVB rays from mostly the sun. Okay? And in these cells, we have the sun that comes in and you have the UVB rays itself and also the warming of the tissue from that sun that's going to result in two physiological reactions or two enzymatic reactions. The first reaction is going to be a photoisomerization reaction. So we've already hit on uh, uh, isomers. So we're going to take and we're going to basically redistribute the chemical bonds. We're not going to change the chemical uh, makeup, but we're going to redistribute the bonds to generate an isomer or a new chemical. So this photoisomer <coughs> photoisomerization reaction is going to take 7-dehydrocholesterol, I'm just going to abbreviate that DHC, 7-DHC, and convert it into 
pre-vitamin D3. Okay, so these are isomers, same chemical makeup, different chemical structure. And that's directly from the light. And now I also said that the skin would increase in temperature. The vitamin B, the pre-vitamin D3 is then going to be thermally isomerized. So a thermal isomerization of pre-vitamin D3 into cholecalciferol or vitamin D3, okay? So you maybe have heard you have to stand in the sun to generate vitamin D. And here is the two chemical uh, equations that are going to result in that production, okay? So we have this modified cholesterol molecule. It's dehydrated on the seventh carbon. And then in the exposure to sun, we're going to generate vitamin D3. By increasing vitamin D3, we now are going to have higher levels of vitamin D3 entering into the bloodstream. Which, by the way, if you take a vitamin D supplement, you're subverting these first two chemical reactions and you're reducing your reliance on the sun. You don't have to spend as much time in the sun. So you enter the bloodstream, or the vitamin D enters the bloodstream through the vasculature in the dermis. And it begins to circulate all over the place. One of the places vitamin D3 is going to be utilized is in the liver. And in the liver, we have another uh, chemical reaction that re results in the production of a molecule called Calcidiol. Calcidiol enters into the bloodstream from the liver and makes its way to the kidney. Calcitriol is going to be produced from calcidiol in the kidney. And calcitriol is actually going to enter into the bloodstream, and this is what's really going to have the physiological effect. We can consider calcitriol to be a kidney-produced hormone, so this is more or less an endocrine system that we're talking about, but you can see that it spans a variety of different organ systems. I mean, really, if you think about it, integumentary system, digestive system, urinary system, skeletal system, and kidney and uh, urinary and, and digestion here at the end are going to be affected. So we generate calcitriol and the effects of calcitriol, sort of the overall kind of 300,000 foot view take home message is that calcitriol increases or results in an increase in blood calcium production. Now the way that increased calcium is going to be achieved is because calcitriol affects the rates of bone deposition. Bone deposition? That's interesting. Never heard of that before. So we're going to modify bone deposition. And really what's going to result here is we're going to have an increase of blood, I'm, I'm sorry, an increase of calcium being released into the blood from the bone. So an increase in calcium release. So blood calcium levels begin to go up because we're taking that calcium out of the bone. At the level of the kidney, we're going to have a decrease in excretion of calcium and also phosphate. So less will be generated in the urine. This is going to be a urinary system response. And then finally, we also have the digestive system response here. Calcitriol interacts with cells of the digestive system to result in an increase in absorption of both calcium 
and phosphate ions. So you consume those in your diet, the food that you're consuming, and in the presence of high levels of calcitriol, those are going to be pulled through at a high rate. 